As I was praying and working over our lesson tonight, um, I had the word became flesh was my title. And I worked on that just in my spirit for a week. And I wanted to really hone in on the fact that Jesus had been made into a fleshly person. The word had been made into flesh. But as this really began to show itself to me over the course of studying, I want to deal with the the whole beholding of the glory of God and what that looks like to John and what that looks like to us because I think this is why the Spirit is saying this in me. I think this is why. Because I don't think that any of us have a real problem with Jesus was here in the flesh. I think that's why we're Christians. We believe a guy named Jesus lived and died and rose from the dead, and we, we, we trust that. But I don't think we really understand his glory. I come up in Pentecostal charismatic circles where we would talk about the glory as this tangible thing that happened during really exciting services. So you get done with a service in which people, maybe there was a lot of shouting or crying or running around the building. We had some services <laughs> falling out in carpet and whatever. And people come out and say, boy, you could really feel the, the glory of God moved in that place tonight. And sometimes you would see someone saved or just some will emotionally connect with the sermon and you would hear that statement kind of bandied about, boy, isn't God's glory real tonight? Boy, the glory of God, I didn't even, we didn't even hear this. The glory of God so thick in this place, like you could cut it with a knife, the atmosphere and kind of even mixed those terms anointing, which we talked a little bit about last week, anointing and glory. So I think as I was preparing this lesson, what I felt the Spirit prompting in me was really to define the glory of God in biblical terms and show you what that looks like for us today. And that it might not only be, and it may not at all be, and I'll try to clarify this as we go, it may not at all be exciting stuff happening, although exciting stuff may happen in the glory of God. But I want to be biblical. I want to see what the Word says about it. To get us there, uh, look at John chapter 1, verse 14. And I want to show you a contrast, as John does, in the character of John the Baptist and the character of Jesus. John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, if you'll recall, I didn't put this on the screen. If you've got your hard copy, you might want to glance back at this. Remember the sixth verse? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Seventh verse, he came for a witness. Okay? Man sent from God came as a witness. Look at 14 again. Word became flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. Two different men, two different ministries, two different descriptions. Remember a couple weeks ago we said John the Baptist is sort of the moon to Jesus' son. Kind of like us. You know, we we revolve around him. He, he's the centerpiece. Whatever we reflect is a reflection of his glory. So if I've got anything worth saying, it's going to be because I've had an encounter with the one who has first said it to me. And so then I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of like the moon, and so are you. That's really John the Baptist. But the moon always goes down, the sun comes up. And so the, and, and I like how in the, in the book of Genesis, when God creates the heavens and the earth, he create, if I were to tell you about creation, I would probably talk about the daytime and then the nighttime, because that's how we live. How'd your day start? Well, it started this morning. No one says my day started at night unless you're maybe working third shift, you know. But most of us, my day started today. But when you read the Bible, it says the evening and the morning were the first day. So in God's retelling, he starts with the darkness and then he proceeds to the light. Why? Because God proceeds, God takes us from darkness into light. He takes us from chaos into order. Or let's say it this way. We start with the moon and we move to the sun in the economy of God with John the Baptist and then Jesus. So that's the moon and then the sun. But, but notice John is sent and he's a witness. Jesus 
became flesh and dwelt. John is a man sent with a message. Jesus comes to us first as the Logos, became flesh, and so it's as if Christ exists first and foremost as the Logos, as the Word, and then takes on a human form. I like to say it this way. There's nowhere in the Old Testament that calls him Jesus. Why? Because he's not yet Jesus. He's the Logos. He's just, he's the Word, but then when he's born in Nazareth, or he's born in Bethlehem and grows up and, and becomes what we know as Jesus, he takes into himself, because the word becomes flesh, and then that becomes a reality in us. Jesus is not here to say, John's here to say, Jesus is here to be. Okay? And that's the difference in Jesus and in you and I, or it's the difference rather in John the Baptist and in Jesus. So the word dwelt, among us, and we beheld his glory. I want to stick on dwelt for a minute because this is an interesting word when we read it. Um, it just sounds like he was here, but we're reading it 2,000 years after the fact, and that's not what it would have sounded like to those that day. This, to me, is a very interesting piece of Greek. Um, you will not find this word again in the New Testament until the book of Revelation. And then it's a bunch of times in the book of Revelation, which is interesting to me. Paul not, doesn't talk about dwelt. Peter doesn't talk about dwelt. John never again talks about dwelt. It seems like a common word. It's like it would be everywhere. Anywhere you talk about, maybe the spirit dwells or he dwells in us. No. But in Revelation, whenever we start getting into Jewish temple imagery, we get the word again. In fact, it's five times in the book of Revelation, the same Greek word for the word dwell. Now I'm not going to go all through all the Revelation texts, but I find that very interesting that we don't hear a lot about the dwelt. And why is that? This is a very Jewish phrase, very familiar to a Hebrew audience. They needed to see Christ first and foremost through the imagery of Moses. That's important. If they don't see Jesus first through the imagery of Moses, they can't trust that he's from God because the covenant they're dwelling under is the Mosaic covenant. So Jesus has to come born of a woman, born under the law. It's necessary he's born under the law. That way Jesus can confirm himself to a Jewish audience. So look at Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 23. Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Catch the word tabernacle because the word tabernacle used in this text is the, that building that Moses is instructed to set up in the wilderness in which God would dwell over the Ark of the Covenant. When God moved, remember the fire by night, smoke by day, fire by night, cloud by day, fire by night, when the cloud moved or the fire moved and then went over here, they were to come and pick the tabernacle up and carry it over to the fire, and then God would rest over it. So the tabernacling of God is God dwelling among his people. Keep this in mind, God's not dwelling in his people in the Old Covenant. He's dwelling among his people. He can't dwell in his people. He has to redeem his people. He has to purchase his people. The Word becomes flesh to do something. The Word becomes flesh for that big tabernacle word. That word you read in John 1, 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's the Hebrew equivalent of the Word was made flesh and tabernacled amongst us. What would this have looked like? Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting. They came out and blessed the people. And then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Notice whenever we are introduced to the tabernacle and the fire falling on the altar, we're introduced to the glory of the Lord. And what happens when they see the glory of the Lord? They shout and they fall on their faces. Don't equate this with they shouted excitedly. Okay? They don't shout excitedly. They shout out of fear and fall on their faces. How could they not? They just watched fire come out of nowhere and consume a sacrifice until there was nothing left. They're not in awe. In fact, they go into massive sin right after this in the next few chapters of the book of Leviticus. 
because there is a there's a fear that comes over them that is associated in their minds with the glory of the Lord. Because here's what Israel thinks. If God shows up in glory, we're scared to death. Now, do we know this for sure? Well, every time an angel shows up in the Old Testament, people are falling on their face hoping God doesn't kill them. Every time the glory of the Lord enters a room in the Old Testament, people are freaking out. They're in fear and trembling because they equate glory with He's so holy and I'm so unholy that... I, I don't need to stand in his presence. In fact, I used to say that. I used to say, boy, I'll tell you what, if the glory of God were to come in this room like it was at the book of Acts, all that foolishness people have got going on, that, that would be over with. You'd fall on your face in front of an almighty God. And really all I was doing was describing the God that, or the way Leviticus describes God prior to the word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. Because when Leviticus is written, the word hasn't become flesh and dwelt among us. There's no man named Jesus. God is dealing with us tabernacle, and the tabernacle's mobile. It's moving everywhere. God gets unhappy with what's going on here. Boom, picks up and moves. Israel moves with him. Glory of the Lord falls. Everybody falls on their face, shouts, screams. Let's start the process all over again. Word becomes flesh and tabernacles among us was John's way of saying God wrapped himself up in human flesh, or as I like to say, God wrapped himself in an earth suit and became a man. He put on the form of a man so that he could be the tabernacle for us. And look at John 1.14 again, because watch what happens when you see a tabernacle. The word became flesh, it tabernacled among us, and what happens? We beheld his glory... That glory was of the only begotten of the Father. That glory is full of grace and truth. So what happened in Leviticus? Tabernacle is set up. Fire comes down. That's called glory. Everybody falls on their face. What happens in John 1? Jesus shows up. I know he's not called Jesus here. We're getting to that. We know where we're going because we've read John over and over and over again. But the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. It was literal. When John writes this, this is risky because what John is saying is in Jesus, we saw a living, breathing, moving, walking, talking, living, dying tabernacle. The presence of God was on this man. He was a cloud by day and a fire by night. And we looked at his glory. Well, what happened when we looked at his glory? Well, if in Leviticus, we should have all fell down on our faces screaming and crying. We didn't do that with this man. We didn't fall down on our faces screaming and crying when we met this man. In fact, when we met this man, we saw his glory, but it was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Begotten here is an interesting word. This is one child. It's almost literally the compound in the Greek. Um, Monogenes in the Greek, which is a, a, a word that is what it sounds like. One genos, offspring, one offspring. But really, it's relationally. It's, it's, it's the word you would use if it, for, for your most beloved kid. And so here's John saying, we beheld him as if he were the most beloved kid God had. Well, that's a pretty good way of saying it. When we looked at Jesus, we thought, wow. God loves that guy, okay? So, which is what I think is important for us because when we really get a revelation of the love of the Father in us through Christ, we should be looking at ourselves as, wow, he must really love me. 